And last but not least, we have our very own uh, Dr. Natasha Roberts. She's a specialist nurse, um, clinical research fellow uh, for, for the CRE Respond, UQ and Metro North Health here in Australia. Hello, everyone. So I'm Natasha, um, Natasha Roberts. I'm a part of CRE Respond and I'm a senior research fellow. And my role within the CRE is uh, leading the health services and implementation research. Uh, and um, we don't have actually a lot of research data um, about microsampling in routine health services. Uh, there are some acceptability studies that are starting to come out in the single sites, small numbers. Um, it's great, there's stuff emerging. So what I'm going to present to you today is some lessons that we've learned while we've been working towards an implementation study of our own here in our health service. Uh, and um, hopefully I can share those learnings with others um, so that they can incorporate that into their own work. And if anyone's ever seen me present before, I always put this slide up. It's um, a slide from a consumer expert that I work with, Leona Young. I've been working with her for about 10 years and she always puts this at the beginning of her presentations. And at the CRE forum, I put it up and I just really like it now. And I think it's sort of, it's key to any implementation research, particularly when you're working with health services, um, that you can't really implement successfully and have partnership unless everyone's sitting together around the same table. And so there are a couple of touch points that I wanted to um, uh, move towards today. Um, I want to draw on um, having clinical teams sitting at the table and drawing on their expertise, patients and their supports, carers, parents, um, the expertise of our pathology services that also need to be sitting at the table, um, the expertise of our researchers and what they bring to discussions and design, and also what that should say what should implementation look like. Um, and I'm talking about lessons that we've learned ourselves. And so first of all, um, looking towards the expertise of clinical teams um, and taking into consideration local protocols and the workflows that happen, the ideal scenario would be that you would introduce microsampling um, and implement it in a way that it fits beautifully and neatly into local protocols and fits into local workflows as well. But also this has to, you know, clinical environments, they're complex environments. So there's interprofessional teams, there's nursing, there's pharmacy, there's allied health physios that come and work in ICU on little baby's chests and all sorts of teams that are all involved in the care of patients. And that, that they all need to be taken into consideration when you're implementing anything um, pathology teams that come and collect blood, all of those um, different services. Um, and there's always competing priorities in a clinical environment and limited resources. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration and uh, our clinical teams are the ones that understand those mechanisms best. Um, and, um, and so they're an absolutely essential resource um, when you're looking towards designing an approach for implementation. Um, and commonly in research, if we want to sort of step back, look at, at, at a theoretical approach, um, end user engagement in research is well recognised as a vital part of implementation. And I guess it just, um, what do we mean by end user engagement? There's lots of models, frameworks that we can use, case studies, but at the end of the day, engagement occurs in many different areas of health and in health research. But what it really does is it takes into consideration the experiences and knowledge of those people that you're interacting with um, and they have an important perspective. Um, but what it also does, it's very rewarding if you have meaningful collaboration um, and you take into consideration the priorities of the, um, of the clinical teams, governance that they have to work with um, within um, and how you translate knowledge into practice. And then if we look towards the expertise of patients and families, our implementation studies in the neonatal intensive care 
So um, our little babies are unable to speak for themselves, but their parents, their carers can. Um, and But, you know, in adult populations, um, we do know from the research that information is the most important thing to patients. They want to be informed. They want to be able to make informed decisions. Um, they also want to know who to contact if, if they, they don't know if something goes wrong, if they're uncertain, they need to have access to information and who to contact. Um, and their priorities, well-being and quality of life, um, not um, at the effectiveness of microsampling. So, you know, we just got to make sure we align with, uh, with the priorities of patients. Um, and patients, there's a lot of strong literature. Patients will make decisions based on the impact of what they do on their loved ones. They will prioritise their loved ones um, as part of their decision-making process. So it's important to understand those priorities. Um, and with regards to supports, there's not a lot of research on um, carer roles, and but it, there's some emerging, um, especially in the cancer space, which is a space that I'm also very familiar with. Um, and carers see themselves as the, the gatekeepers. They're the ones that are being vigilant, making sure nothing gets missed because the patients are not well or they need extra support. They also need to know who to contact, but um, they will focus on um, the technical aspects of medications specifically. That is always a strong theme in any implementation study if medications are involved. And so if you bring in a device like microsamples, that they'll need really good quality information. Um, and then you draw on their knowledge and their expertise. Uh, and we have really great structures within health systems um, uh, to, and frameworks to lean on and to help guide us. Um, uh, uh, the Australian um, Quality and Safety Accreditation um, Bible um, has a standard called partnering with consumers and it, it's essential that all activity that happens in health services demonstrates partnership with consumers and that they're involved with design, um, evaluation and have an opportunity to contribute through feedback and other mechanisms. Uh, and, and it's vital that for any implementation study, these standards are taken into consideration. And then the expertise of pathology services. This is an area I don't know a lot about. I'm lucky to have Steve um, to lean on. Um, but there are, um, we're fortunate to have a pathology team with um, Pathology Queensland that are going to be analysing the microsamples for us. Um, and But they are also working within very, very strict um, uh, uh, requirements um, and... Um, so the ISO 16189 <laughs> standard um, from, um, from NATA is, is, a, is a requirement for pathology services to be able to do pathology business. Um, and that work is always in partnership with the, the College of Pathologists and um, who set very, very high standards um, with regards to um, uh, um, uh, you know, um, doing pathology. <laughs> Sorry, it's very, I'm very tired. It's the end of the day. Um, but um, also, um, so for microsamples, though, that's not standard business. So in order for that to be done through our pathology la labs, they have to do a validation process um, in order to um, prepare. And that, and that in itself is quite extensive. Um, and... All of this stuff takes away from um, routine care that happens in pathology services. Um, we have a high acuity pathology service here attached to our hospital. Um, it takes time, it takes people, it takes money and it takes equipment. And um, taking on microsampling takes a machine out of action. Um, and it's, the different, it's a different um, uh, workflow than it would be for normal standard of care um, uh, antibiotic levels um, and so there's a dis there's an inevitable disruption of workflows for pathology teams so it's important to understand those and work with those um, from from the clinical area the blood collection all the way to the pathology service um, and then 
back again, making the results um, accessible and meaningful to clinical teams. And so that is where relative advantage is the term that we use a lot in implementation scientists, in implementation science. What is the relative advantage of taking on this load of microsampling uh, when we already have an approach which is working just fine? And uh, for our pathology teams, it's the stories of clinical teams um, and the impact on babies um, and the benefits that can come with microsampling. And then, of course, there's the expertise of researchers. So as we saw with Pia and Mark's presentation, researchers have a lot of expertise with uh, microsampling. Uh, there's preclinical knowledge, there's preclinical experience, there's lessons to be learned. We need these expert researchers sitting at the table um, as we co-design and implement into health services. Um, and the researchers also, and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but researchers also have a very important role about building evidence in a rigorous way that is meaningful um, and, that, and so that it has impact. And it's not just, because what can happen is when things go into the clinical sphere, it's a bit complex, it's a bit chaotic. You can, that rigor can drop off and then you lose that ability to build new knowledge. So it's important that researchers stay engaged, stay involved, so we continue to build that knowledge and rigor. Um, obviously, researchers um, are limited by funding um, and, and, you know, we'd all like to do these amazing, wonderful things, but the reality is we are dictated to the, by the funding that we have available. And um, nothing's more regulated than research. Um, and so, you know, we've always got ICH GCP um, guidance. Um, there's, um, in Australia, uh, for us to be able to use VAMS, for example, they need to be approved by the Therapeutics Goods Administration. Um, we've, we've got ethics um, processes and governance processes um, in line, um, going parallel um, with our implementation work. Uh, and, and all of this needs to be taken into consideration. And so what should implementation look like? And, you know, I could speak for hours about this. This is something that's very important to me, but I think there's three key things that um, I'd like everyone to sort of take home. Um, there's always a pre-implementation phase. So you just don't run in and jump in and, and work it out as you go. You have to plan implementation and that can involve that early co-design, everyone sitting around the table. That can be done with qualitative interviews. It can be done with surveys what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's going to work. Um, you can map workflows and go, okay, this is what our normal workflow is. Where could we, where could we put in the micro sample collection? Where could we put in getting that micro sample to the lab? Um, where can we put in that the results will become available in a timely way that fits in with decision-making of clinicians with antibiotic dosing as a part of ward round? So, mapping workflow. So it's all of that pre-implementation planning. When that's done well, everything else tends to flow um, quite nicely behind. For us, our co-design pre-implementation phase went much longer than we planned, but it's quite surprising how now that that's happened, everyone's totally engaged and with the program because of that investment of time to co-design. And then there's the implementation phase. And, and I guess it's important with the implementation phase, you're, you're measuring the, um, the effectiveness or the, um, you know, the validity of using a microsample. Um, you're building models, but alongside of that, you've, it's important to have implementation measures. Um, is this feasible? Um, is fidelity being um, maintained? That map that you did with the workflow, did that keep going that way? Did it get changed? Why did it get changed? Have that ongoing measurement of implementation. And then it's always really beneficial. This is the part that always gets forgotten because we've run out of money, but hold with the program, do an evaluation, find out what worked, what didn't work and what will be needed for you to scale this work to a much larger study, multi-site, multi-country, whatever, but uh, that evaluation phase is gold, um, especially for seeking further funding. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for the chance to speak. Different lens.
<clears throat> well, that was our last presentation for the day, so it's time for questions and answers. Steve, do you want to come closer so people on Zoom can hear you? Hello, my, um, I've got a question for Pierre, our first um, uh, speaker. The, we looked at the uh, Nervaplex cards when they first came out, and they seemed quite expensive compared to dry blood spots. But you seem to be getting a lot of joy out of them. Uh, do you recommend their use? Of which one? Sorry. They used to be called Novaplex, but it's the dried plasma spot card. It's called... Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, uh, well, it depends. Uh, just to tell you a uh, sort of uh, range uh, here uh, in, in Italy, uh, a single card costs 30 euros, so approximately 30 dollars. So probably in specific cases, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it should be useful, of course. Uh, when you have to do... Uh, of course, intense sampling, I think, so for research purposes mainly, well, uh, the, this, uh, this aspect, uh, it's probably covered by fundings. Uh, from the healthcare perspective, well, it is uh, it isn't not widely used here, but in specific cases, for instance, as for patient living far away from medical center, which is what is necessary to, for instance, for dalbabansin, um, doing two or three um, monitoring uh, during the course of several months, I think it is a it is an affordable solution and cost effective solution. But for instance, for for in, in, in other instances uh, for multi drug resistant pathogens, uh, well, um, for patients that uh, are. In pa who are inpatient, sorry, so in hospital, well, uh, I honestly think that the teleimmune card uh, um, is not, not cost-effective. It would have a great advantage over the dried blood spot or the VAMs because you're getting concentration in plasma rather than the concentration in, in blood, which would be worth something. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Love to talk. Thank you, Steve. Um, Professor Roberts, any questions? Yes, yeah, so I've got a question for Peter Giorgio again, and then I've got a follow up one for Natasha. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Peter Giorgio and his lab were the first lab to develop B lifetime therapy drug monitoring in the world, which, as I understand, first happened back in 1995. And uh, in Australia, we were pioneers back in 2008, but uh, we're, we're quite young relative to what Pier Giorgio and uh, his colleagues um, have been able to facilitate over the years. So one of the things that I'm quite interested in with uh, Dalbavancin in particular is because it's got such a long half-life, it means that the, the convenience of when you perform the sample is, of course, a, a really good um, characteristic of it because it has quite a flat concentration for such a long timeline. Have you looked at optimised sampling times to then use that to estimate uh, with, you know, for a couple of weeks' time when the next um, dose should be given. And similarly, yeah. a, a, a follow-up question. Oh, you, you answer that one first, and I'll tell you my follow-up question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, the problem with the vaccine is uh, uh, what to do after the first 20 days of treatment. This is the question because... Dalbavancin was started for ensuring good coverage for uh, a skin and soft tissue infection, which traditionally last 14 days. And so for 14 days or 20 days, concentration are good. But as far as long as Dalbavancin use grow, has grown uh, for flammel uses, so for instance, for osteomyelitis or prostatic joint infection, which are Condi clinical condition which require long-lasting treatment. The problem is how to redose and when to redose the next uh, 150 or, uh, or, or or whatsoever dose. So the first TDM, to answer your question, the first TDM 
in patient needed needing uh, more than three doses uh, is uh, done uh, we, we we do this approach is done after 30 days and then approximately after 20 to 40 days every 20 to 40 days for patients who require longer treatment. But it depends because dalbavancin is eliminated by renal root for 30-40%. And so in patients with uh, quite um, at the end of the stick of renal insufficiency, uh, co concentration may, be, may, may remain above the threshold for two months. On the contrary, for patient, for younger patients, uh, 20, 25 days could be not enough to ensure good concentration. So for this reason, TBM is is, is useful for the vaccine. So the, the, the range, I would say, from 20 days to two months. On average, 35, 40, every 35, 40 days. So my follow-up question relates to the health economics of it all, because the cost of one dose of Dalbavancin, I'm not sure what it is in, in the EDU, maybe... 1500 euro, you know, 1000 euro, like it's very expensive relative to other drugs. Yeah, sure. And so if you're able to then spare one or two doses in a three month or a six month treatment because of some TDNS performed, then that's very cost effective, I would imagine. Yeah, have absolutely. You, have you um, ever been able to perform like a, a cost effective analysis or, or to think about what the, the value proposition would be? Thank you, Jason. That's a very, very interesting point. And it's uh, not yet, not yet, but it's our intention to do as soon as we can. But it's a very important question. One vial of, uh, of uh, Dalbavancin costs uh, uh, 500 euros. So uh, one vial of 500 milligrams. So we usually do uh, three vials, so, 100, uh, so 1,500 milligrams, so three vials. And you're absolutely true. The the the, the cost effectiveness of TDM for Delta vaccine from an economic point of view is that you can spare doses, even because uh, um, staphylococcal susceptibility is very low. So probably this dosage of uh, fifteen hundred is a big dose. So probably many patients will suffice with uh, I don't know uh, four hundred milligram every 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 month i i don't know but susceptibility is very very low so yeah you, you, you the, your your um, your observation is very very pertinent and and correct thank you uh i've got a question for natasha that i'd like to ask as well and pia Giorgio, you may want to comment on this afterwards but natasha my question relates to uh the patient acceptability of micro sampling uh it, it's a bit different. You, you would have seen some of the um, the figures that Mark included in his graphic, whereby he had multiple uh, micro samples that were taken. Uh, that's obviously not particularly common in a, a TDM setting, a therapeutic drug monitoring setting. But what, what's your understanding about the patient or even the family acceptability of micro sampling for the uh, therapeutic drug monitoring? Uh, so. Um, in the literature, there is some limited evidence um, and acceptability is very high. Uh, so it's around about 90 to 100 percent acceptability um, ratings from um, patients. Um, and uh, and also working with uh, consumer experts as partners um, and, and it's some of the stuff that Pia was talking about as well. Um, uh, the advantage of not having to come into a hospital, you know, this is um, patients um, who have had uh, renal tra uh, kidney transplants, um, you know, the prospect of not having to come into the hospital all the time um, when you're already immunocompromised and being able to send samples back um, is um, very attractive uh, for some patients. Um, and. Um, and our consumer partners um, with the options study, uh, the parents were obviously very keen uh, to minimise um, the trauma and pain from um, heel lancing, um, looking towards using microsampling. So um, I, I guess it's that trade-off of what microsampling brings. Thank you. Pia Giorgio, what have you found that your 
um, patients that you've um, asked to sample via microsampling, what, how, what do they feel about it? What's the feedback that they give you? Well, the feedback is always positive. Uh, it's always positive, especially in children and uh, in elderly patients uh, uh, who live uh, far away from, from our hospital, from medical center. They feel a sense of uh, care towards them um, and to support, which uh, probably with a traditional sampling, with, uh, which keeps also all the shipping uh, difficulties of, uh, of, of delivery of blood samples, which should be centrifugated if uh, one day pass from sample collection to, to analysis, which uh, limits a lot the feasibility of traditional TDM in this setting. What well, micro sampling uh, overcomes this, uh, this uh, logistic problem and it is a, a good, a, a very good solution, I think, in these settings. Yeah, and the acceptability is high. And a follow-up question for you, Pierre Giorgio, if I may, relates to, you did comment about the assays, and obviously the different assays that need to be developed compared to what maybe you had first developed for conventional sampling. Are those assays substantially more difficult to develop, or are they just a slight change to what your existing assays were for conventional blood sampling? Yeah, yeah. The steps are essentially the same. Uh, the, the, um, the solution we are with methanol, which is the element of the, of, uh, of, uh, of all the, of all the preparation. So the steps are essentially the same and just the quantity smaller. And for this, you need a spectrometer with high performances to manage uh, very low quantity of sample at the end, instead of putting, uh, when a traditional TDM, you put, uh, um, uh, 150 microliters into the spectrometer with the micro sampling, you put, uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 microliters. So yeah, you need to have uh, an instrument, uh, uh, a new instrumentation that can, uh, that can use this low volume, but in terms of, uh, steps, uh, the steps are barely the same. There are just a quantity of small. Thank you very much. That's and great. Thank you. And so we've got a question um, on the chat uh, from Michelle Cree. Um, with most grants seeking consumer engagement, how do um, parents or carers get involved with developing PK studies? Um, and so I guess there's a couple of different ways uh, that that can happen. Uh, within CRE Respond, we've got a consumer and end user panel, uh, which has um, a, people with different lived experiences, um, some with lived experiences of a, as being a carer, but also of um, being an ICU patient. Um, and uh, th those consumers undergo research training uh, and um, and... Uh, and uh, contribute in that way. Um, in in my slides, I was uh, I pointed out the partnering with consumers um, standard that health services need to um, meet, and so invariably health services will have uh, consumer representatives involved with quality and safety committees, um, and and there'll be consumers aligned with specific work areas and. Sometimes if you present to those committees to seek advice, if, especially if the research is taking place in the hospital, um, it's a great opportunity to also get uh, that input from consumers. They don't usually have research training, but they certainly have a really good understanding of the health service and they have uh, that lived experience. But there are multiple models, whether you've got individual people that contribute, whether we sort of like to have a steering committee, which... Um, provides advice and then we, if we want to have an investigator on a grant um, or a study um, we'll do that but people get remunerated and um, for their time but yeah it's a very it's not an easy question to answer but there are lots of different ways that you can go about it. Well excellent uh, we thank everyone for joining us today um, we'd love to have your feedback so please take a minute to complete uh, to scan this QR code and complete this quick survey.
And well, uh, we welcome you to see the 2025 education program and to subscribe to CRE Education. Also, you can watch the recordings on our YouTube channel and follow us on X and LinkedIn.